Psalm 62 is a wonderful psalm that emphasizes the idea that God was David's only rock, his only salvation. And I attribute this psalm to David because in the title of the psalm, that's the part in the text, the original text that comes before verse 1, we see this, to the chief musician, to Dedethun, a psalm of David. So we know that David wrote this psalm. We don't know exactly from what period in his life he wrote it. This is another one of these psalms in which David is in trouble and needs God's help. And there were a lot of situations like that in David's life. He wrote it to the chief musician. And again, that title, the chief musician, it's thought by some people to be the Lord God himself. Others suppose the chief musician to be a leader of the choirs or the musicians in David's time. People such as Heman the singer or Asaph, uh, that's in 1 Chronicles chapter 6 and 1 Chronicles chapter 16 and 1 Chronicles chapter 25. You'll see references to those men, Heman and Asaph. Now, this also says that it's to Jeduthun. Jeduthun is also mentioned in the titles of Psalm 39 and Psalm 77. He was one of the musicians appointed by David to lead Israel's public worship. Again, you'll find that in 1 Chronicles 16, verse 41, 1 Chronicles chapter 25, and the first three verses. Charles Spurgeon wrote this concerning Jeduthun. He says, quote, The sons of Jeduthun were porters or doorkeepers, according to 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 42. Those who serve well make the best of singers, and those who occupy the highest posts in the choir must not be ashamed to wait at the post of the doors of the Lord's house. That's an interesting idea, isn't it? Spurgeon's putting together those two verses from 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 41 and 42, which speaks of Jeduthun's musical ability, but also of his practical service. And it is a blessed thing when we find those who are gifted with such sort of artistic abilities as music and singing and musical ability and all the rest, that they also have a heart for practical service. This was one of those men, Jeduthun. So now we come to the first two verses of Psalm 62, where David is waiting upon God. Here we go. Ready? Truly, my soul silently waits for God. From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. Now, what's interesting is the emphasis from the very beginning of Psalm 62 is on surrendered silence before God and God alone. Now, this isn't so clear from the English text But we find, or at least it's reported to me regarding the Hebrew text, that the word that begins Psalm 62 in the New King James Version, which is that is the translation that I'm teaching from, truly my soul waits for God. The word truly is often translated in the Hebrew alone or only, and it seems to have that sense here. In other words, the idea is to emphasize that it is only upon God that David's soul silently waits. James Montgomery Boyce put it this way in his commentary on Psalm 62. He said this, quote, It's hard to see this in the English text because the Hebrew is almost untranslatable. But in the Hebrew text, the word only or alone occurs five times in the first eight verses and once in verse nine. And Derek Kidner said of that word that's translated here, truly or alone, he said, quote, it's an emphasizer to underline a statement or to point to a contrast. It's insistent repetition gives the psalm a tone of special earnestness. So this is what David is saying here. Lord, alone, I'm looking to you. Alone, I'm waiting for you. Alone, my soul silently waits you. And not the emphasis is on David himself being alone, but that David's trust is in no other. David's focus is in no other. His focus, his hope, his, his anticipation, it is purely upon God. F.B. Meyer, I think, wisely said of this idea in verses 1 and 2, This is why God keeps you waiting. All that is of self and nature must be silent 
one voice after another cease to boast, one light after another to be put out until the soul is shut up to God alone. And that's where David is in this psalm. That's why he says here in verse 1, from him comes my salvation. Now what's interesting, in many psalms, David begins by telling of his great need, and there's a lot of psalms like that, Um, Many Psalms begin by David describing his present crisis. But David here begins by declaring his great confidence in God, his great trust in God. Before he said anything about his problem, he's saying, Lord, I'm looking to you. I am trusting in you. What's very interesting about Psalm 62, and I don't know if you mark in your Bible, you might want to put a little star next to Psalm 62 because there's something about this Psalm that's remarkable. You ready for this? Psalm 62 definitely seems to come from a time of trouble. That's the whole tone of the psalm. But it asks God for nothing. It is full of faith. It's full of trust, but it has absolutely no fear in it, no despair in it, and no petition unto God. Instead, David confidently says, and here we're going to find another use of only or alone. Verse 2, he only is my rock and my salvation. David trusted in God alone for his strength and stability. This description of a man completely focused upon God for his help, but fully resolved to look nowhere else, it's simply, God, I'm looking to you and you alone. As G. Campbell Morgan said on this, he said, because God only is our rock, let us ever be silent only for God. Now, verses 3 and 4, David's going to complain to his enemies and of his enemies. Ready for this? He says, How long will you attack a man? You shall be slain, all of you. Like a leaning wall and a tottering fence, they only consult to cast him down from his high position. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Selah. Now, if you notice there in the beginning of verse 3, David says, How long will you attack a man? You see, David's faith was in God alone, but man, he had something to say to his enemies, did he not? He rebuked them for their crazy persistence in attacking him. And he warned them of the judgment to come. That's why he says in the second line of verse 3, You shall be slain, all of you. Matter of fact, in verse 3, he adds another image on there. Did you see that? Where he says, like a leaning wall and a tottering fence. Now, David's image here is clear enough. But to be honest, there's some disagreement among translators and commentators as to whom this applies. We have the picture. Don't you picture a wall just about to fall over? It's leaning over. It's not going to, you know, you give it the slightest push and it's going to fall. A tottering fence. There's an old wooden fence and the supports are rotted away and it's just about over. It's not going to stand very long. Now, the New King James Version, again, that's the translation I teach from here. This presents the opponents of David as that leaning wall and tottering fence. It's David's enemies that are about to fall over. Other people in their translations think that David himself was the leaning wall and that his weakness was unfairly taken advantage of by his enemies. So the image is clear exactly to whom it applies. It's not so clear, but notice what they're saying here. Verse four, they consult to cast him down. David described his enemies as those who only think through a matter if it involves bringing down a man of God. (laughs) They were liars especially in the sense of being two-faced. Did you see that in verse 4? They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Now, in the midst of such wicked men, at the end of verse 4, did you see that pause? David said, hey, Selah, at the end of it. Pause and think about such wicked men. But he doesn't want us to stay there for very long because now in verse 5, he's going to renew and re-express his confidence in God. Ready for this? Verses 5, 6, and 7. We read this. My soul, wait silently for God alone. 
for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Now, this is interesting. In the opening lines of Psalm 62, David said that this was the state of his soul. He says, again, Truly my soul silently waits for God, or only my soul waits for God, or God alone. That's the idea there in verse 1. Now, in verse 5, he's speaking to his soul, telling it to remain in that place and in surrender to God. David's complete expectation was on God, but he wanted it to stay there. And I think this could be a beautiful way for a believer to pray. Lord, I trust in you. Now, David, you keep trusting in the Lord. That's what David seems to be doing here. When I said David there, I meant myself. (laughs) Uh, Don't you see that idea there? David says, I'm waiting silently. My soul is waiting for God alone. And then you speak to your own soul and you say, now you keep doing that which is good. You continue in that place of waiting silently for God alone. And again, This is the idea of having confidence or hope in no one or in nothing else, but in God alone. That wonderful Puritan Bible commentator, John Trapp, said something wonderful about this. He said this, quote, They trust not God at all who trust him not alone. He that stands with one foot on a rock and another foot upon a quicksand will sink and perish just as certainly as he who stands with both feet upon a quicksand. David knew this, and therefore he called earnestly upon his soul to trust only in God. I love that image from John Trapp. If you have one foot on a rock and one foot on quicksand, you're going to fall just as quickly as if you have both feet on the quicksand. And so we need to have our focus, our trust, our hope in God alone. And to be able to say this, he only is my rock and my salvation. David assured himself by repeating that line from verse 2. It was true for David, but it was important to him that he remain true to that idea. So he prayed, he declared that it would be so. By the way, did you see that line in verse 6? I like that, where he says in verse 6, he is my defense. You know what's beautiful about that? He doesn't just indicate that God is his defender, which is a wonderful thing to have God be your defender. But God is his actual defense. His defense can be summed up in one word, and it's God. It's God alone. And therefore, when you have such a focus upon the Lord, you can make that triumphant statement that David makes here in verse 6, where he says, I shall not be moved. David is there repeating the idea from verse 2, but but with a small variation I want to read you this line from verse 2. Check this out. In verse 2, he says, I shall not be greatly moved. Now, in verse 6, he says, I shall not be moved. (laughs) He seems to be moving to an even stronger position. So in verse 2, he's kind of like saying, I'm not going to be moved a lot. In verse 6, I'm not going to be moved at all. His confidence in the Lord and in the Lord's defense is growing. That's why he can say beautifully in verse 7, My refuge is in God. Again, the emphasis reflects David's decision to trust in nothing else or in no one else. Brothers and sisters, this is a decision that we can make. Oh, God has to work in us to make the decision. I'm not trying to deny that. But there comes a time and time where we just need to be able to say, my trust is in God alone. My refuge is in him. That's where David was at. He said, God alone is his salvation. That's in verse 6. Then in verse 7, he says, God alone is my glory, my rock, my strength, my refuge. We sense that David was tempted to trust in many different things, but he refused to put his trust or his hope in any of those other things, and he kept his expectation in God alone. Now, before I leave verses six and seven, I do want to point out something, or maybe I'll just read you this quote from Charles Spurgeon, because Charles Spurgeon expresses it very well. He says, 
observe how the psalmist brands his own initials upon every name which he rejoicingly gives to God. My expectation, my rock, my salvation, my glory, my strength, my refuge. He is not content to know that the Lord is all these things. He acts in faith towards him and lays claim to him under every character. So now here in this wonderful place, as he comes out, David, having received all those names and wonderful titles of God, not just this theoretical knowledge in his mind, but it's something deeply in his heart that says, I I know that God just isn't a rock. He's my rock. He's not just everybody's salvation. He's my salvation, my glory. Those two letters, M, Y, are very beautiful, very powerful in this sense. So now, after having spoken to his own soul, after having declared his own trust in God, now, starting at verse 8, David is going to teach others about how to do this. By the way, along the way, he's also going to teach himself. So let's look at verse 8, how he's going to teach others to trust in God. Here we go. Ready? Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. I love that phrase. David looks out among the people of Israel. Listen, anybody who would want to listen, whether they're of Israel or not. And he says in verse 8, trust in him at all times, you people. David felt that what was good for him was also good for others. So he says, listen, I found this works for me. I found the glory and the peace and the wonder in trusting in God at all times. Now you need to do the same. Also, David, as a leader of God's people, he spoke wisdom to them. He reminded them that God was worthy at all all times of their trust in him. That's why David says, and it's beautiful there in verse 8, pour out your heart before him. God's strength and stability rightly made David think of him as a rock. That's in verses 6 and 7. Yet David was not so unsensitive. David himself was not unfeeling like a rock, and he knew that God wasn't that. He knew, David knew, that we can pour out our heart before a sensitive God. God is as stable as a rock, but he's not hardened like a rock against us. God invites his people to pour out their heart, their sorrows, their joys, their trust, and even their doubts, all of it poured out before him. Why? Because verse 8 says, God is a refuge for us. He welcomes that poured out heart, just like the cities of refuge, welcome a hunted man in ancient Israel. That's why David could say, God is a refuge for us. Now, he continues this idea of teaching others in verses 9 and 10. David's going to teach the people what or whom not to put their trust in. Ready? Verses 9 and 10. Surely men of low degree are a vapor. Men of high degree are a lie. If they are weighed on the scales, they are altogether lighter than vapor. Do not trust in oppression, nor vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Wow, how honestly David speaks about the human condition. In this psalm, where he speaks much of trusting in God alone, now David explains why it's important to put your trust in God alone and to not put your trust fundamentally in man. Why? Because surely men of low degree are a vapor. They are immaterial. They uh, they disappear as quickly as smoke disappears in the air. Men of low degree are a vapor. Men of high degree are a lie. David understood that whether men are of low degree or of high degree, they are altogether lighter than vapor. There is no substance there worthy of trust. This is why it's important to put your trust in God, not man. 
And again, this is something that is hard for us. We find it so easy to put our trust in man. We find it so easy to entrust our hearts to them. But just like Adam Clark explained, he said this, common men can give no help. They are a vanity and it is folly to trust in them. For although they may be willing, yet they have no ability to help you. Rich men are a lie. They promise much, but perform nothing. They cause you to hope, but mock your expectation. So we don't put our trust. We don't put our trust in men of low degree. We don't put our trust in men of high degree. Our hope, our trust is finally in the Lord. We we have ultimately nothing to fear from man, but also ultimately speaking, we have nothing to hope for from mankind. Our hope, ultimately speaking, is in the Lord. And David continues on here, verse 10. He says, do not trust in oppression, nor vainly hope in robbery. David had seen men advance through cruel and dishonest ways, and he warned the people against this. He understood that the results never really justify the evil used to get the results. So he says there in verse 10, If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Now, let's be honest about this. As a king, David ended up being a very wealthy man. I would not be surprised if by today's standard, we would call King David a billionaire. Yet through most of his early years, he lived in deep poverty. He grew up in a family that wasn't that great or influential. And all those years, those 10 or 15 years when he lived as a fugitive from King Saul, you better believe that he had next to nothing. David knew what it was like to see riches increase But that meant he also knew the foolishness of seeing one's heart, uh, setting one's heart on them. Now, let's be clear. It is possible to hold great wealth without trusting in those riches. But it isn't easy. It's easy to put your heart on riches if you have them. And, And there are at least three ways that I can think of that someone can set their heart on riches. Here's three ways. Number one, they can take excessive pleasure in riches. If you make wealth and money and materialism, if you make those things the source of joy for your life, you may be setting your heart on riches. Secondly, you may place your hope and security in riches. If really looking at a number in a bank account, if it's high enough, you have hope and security. And you're not really taking a look at God's word and taking a look at his promises and saying this and what God promised me. There's a God in heaven and a word that he reveals me. That's the source of my hope, of my security. No, don't set your heart on riches in the sense of putting your hope and security in them. But there's a third way that people can set their heart on riches. They can do it because they grow proud and arrogant because of riches. And look, we've seen that, haven't we? Have we not seen people who are just simply proud and arrogant, and they're arrogant because of all that they think they possess? Whether those riches are rightly achieved or wrongly achieved, they are wrongly used if you trust in them. Brothers and sisters, let's learn from this. Let's gain it deeply in our hearts where it simply says this, If riches increase, do not place your heart on them. Now, verses 11 and 12. David's going to speak to himself now. That's how he's going to end the psalm in verses 11 and 12. God has spoken once. Twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. Also to you, O Lord, belongs mercy. For you render to each one according to his work. This truth was deeply ingrained in David's soul. That's why he can say, God has spoken once and twice I have heard this. That's just sort of a a rhetorical device in the Hebrew phrasing to say, I have really learned this deeply in my life. And what is it that David learned? That power belongs to God. 
and by implication, to none other. That's why David was so determined to trust in God and in God alone. And since power belongs to God, David refused to look for strength anywhere else. Since power belongs to God, David did not long for power unto himself. Since power belongs to God, David did not become arrogant as a ruler. He knew that any power he held, he held it as God's representative. And that's why he can say very sincerely and deeply in verse 12, Also to you, O Lord, belongs mercy. Now, gratefully, David understood that God's nature was much more than power. He is also rich in mercy. Just as men could and should look to God for power, so they should look to God for mercy. Now, mercy here in verse 12 translates one of the great words of the Old Testament. It's that word chesed. It may be better translated as love. Sometimes it's translated as loving kindness. Sometimes it's understood as covenant love or loyal love. Now check this out. David knew that power belongs to God. He states that with great emphasis in the first line of verse 12. Or verse, uh, yeah, verse 12. Um, or excuse me, verse 11. But he also understood from verse 12 that to God belongs mercy. So check this out. God is a God of both power and mercy. I like what James Montgomery Boyce said about this. He said, David says that he's learned two lessons, that God is strong and that God is loving. Amen to that. Now, this meant that David had no expectation of mercy from man. If that mercy came, of course, David was happy about it. But he knew that ultimately this great covenant love, this great mercy belonged to God. Now, we're going to end with the last line here of verse 12. Look at the last line here, verse 12. For you rendered to each one according to his work. Now, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Where did that come from? You see, we don't normally think of that as an expression of God's mercy for God to render to each one according to his work. In some ways, that sounds more like God's judgment than God's mercy. Yet David seems to have in mind here in verse 12, the very last line, the good man or woman whose goodness is despised by this world, the God of mercy will reward their goodness, even if it's goodness on a relative measure, even as the world ignores it or rejects it. I think Spurgeon had a good sense of this, where he says, man neither helps us nor rewards us. God will do both. And so this is what we need to do. We need to meditate on both aspects. That God is full of power, of course. God has spoken once, twice I have heard this that power belongs to God, but also that God is rich in mercy, in love, in loyal love for his people. What a beautiful psalm, Psalm 62 is. Now, before I end, let's take a look at some ways that Psalm 62 points to Jesus. How does Psalm 62 point to Jesus? And I guess we could go through it, and even in just its 12 verses, we could find many, many ways. Let me highlight three ways for you that Psalm 62 points to Jesus. Number one, Jesus knew how to silently trust God for his defense. In verse one, we read this. Truly, my soul silently waits for God. And then in verse two, David wrote, He is my defense. Now, I want you to understand, Jesus showed both aspects of this, especially when he was on trial before the religious authorities and the Roman authorities. What was true of David, 
in a smaller sense was true of Jesus in a greater and higher sense. Jesus, when he was before the religious authorities, he said, no, wait, I'm not going to speak up for myself. I'm going to be silent in the face of these accusations. I'm going to let God defend me. And before Pontius Pilate himself, it said that Pilate marveled that Jesus didn't answer the accusations against him. No, this is a in interesting and impressive way, Jesus knew how to silently trust God for his defense. Secondly, Jesus put his trust in God and not in man. Verse 9 says this, Surely men of low degree are a vapor, men of high degree are a lie. If they are weighed on the scales, they are altogether lighter than vapor. Jesus understood this about humanity, and therefore he ultimately put his trust in God and not in man. I like what it says in John chapter 2, verse 24. It says this, But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. Jesus knew what was in men, so therefore he did not commit himself to them. He did not trust them in the full sense that he trusted his God and Father Jesus understood that, ultimately speaking, we must put our trust in God and not in man. And then finally, verse 11 says, it shows us how Jesus is the God of all power. As I said, verse 11 wonderfully says, God has spoken once, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. Now, one of the great words used for Jesus in the New Testament, one of his wonderful titles, it's found in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, and Revelation chapter 19, verse 15. And it's the word almighty. And that is the ancient Greek word pantokrater, which means he who has his hand on everything. Brothers and sisters, that's power. That's all power. Power belongs to God and Jesus Christ as Revelation uh, chapter 1 and chapter 19 tell us Jesus is the Almighty. He's the Pantocrator. He's the one who has his hand on everything. This power belongs to Jesus Christ. Jesus is the God of all power. I pray that you would know the power of God and the mercy of God and know that you should put your trust in God alone. Let, let me just end with prayer to that effect. Father in heaven, we thank you through the amazing truth taught to us here in Psalm 62. And we simply ask God that you would fill our hearts with a wonderful, blessed awareness of this, a reception of it, that you are a God of power, but you are also a God of surpassing love. Both are true of you, we want to receive both. We want to walk in both. And Lord, for both of those reasons, we want to say that you alone are our trust. You alone are our hope. And Lord, we don't want to become hardened and cynical and, and, and distant from all of humanity. We just simply say, Lord, ultimately our trust is in you. Receive our praise, Lord. We give you thanks and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.